going to get started. I got it. Thanks. Um, so I'm very honored to have Jeff Fisher visiting with us today. Um, Professor Fisher co-directs the Stanford Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, and he is one of the country's leading Supreme Court practitioners. Um, he's argued almost 30 cases before the court. How many is it now? 28. 28. Um, and he was, um, he will smile about this, but he was recently singled out um, as the lawyer in the country with the highest cert grant rate of anyone filing cert petitions. He has wide-ranging substantive expertise, but he's especially well-known for his work in criminal procedure and on the confrontation clause. And he's um, all but single-handedly changed the law in some areas that are familiar to law students, um, like the Riley case about searches incident to arrest and digital privacy, um, and the Crawford case, which fundamentally altered the way the Supreme Court approaches confrontation clause cases. Before he joined the Stanford faculty, Professor Fisher practiced with Davis Wright Tremaine, uh, and he clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court and Judge Stephen Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit. Welcome. Thank, thank you, you very so much. Thank you so much for and being You left here. out the most important part of my bio, which is going further back. I went to Duke undergrad, so it is I a did forget huge, to mention that. Huge, that's the best part, uh, and set, me, set the stage for all that came after. But, it, but more importantly, it's just really fun for me to be back at Duke, so... Uh, and, and to see um, students who are still getting to spend wonderful time here. <laughs> Professor Fisher is a loyal Duke alum, and du there is a, a long institutional history <laughs> connecting him to all of you. So yes, of course. Um, and one of the, so we're going to talk about the different stages of Supreme Court litigation in a kind of informal discussion. But um, the, what's really interesting about Professor Fisher's practice is that it's a clinical practice. Uh, there are only a handful of Supreme Court clinics in the country, and um, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear about your experience as an advocate in front of the court generally, but I'd love to start with some particular details about your practice and the kinds of cases that you have and how they come to you. Uh, sure. Uh, so the, the Stanford Clinic that I co-direct with another faculty member, Pam Carlin, um, has now been up and running for uh, over 10 years. Uh, so, and, and, and I don't get any credit for the idea. Uh, it was Pam's idea uh, hatched uh, with our then dean, Kathleen Sullivan. Um, uh, and Pam um, is, a, uh, is herself a distinguished Supreme Court practitioner and, 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 and civil rights and constitutional law specialist. Um, but the original idea was, um, and, 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 and I'll say this because it, sounds, it might sound counterintuitive to you all, uh, but, but back in the days when we were clerks, uh, you know, a lot of Supreme Court cases were not particularly well lawyered. Uh, and you some might, might ask yourself why that would be. Uh, you know, you'd imagine that cases when they get to the Supreme Court are all going to have uh, fabulous uh, counsel. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, and there's a variety of reasons why that might be, but I think the biggest reason is that of the 75, 80 cases the court hears a year, there are only a handful, maybe a dozen, uh, where from the moment that case is filed, everybody knows it's a really big deal. You know, the challenge to Obamacare, uh, is, uh, is Texas's law restricting access to abortion clinics constitutional and the ACLU comes in and Planned Parenthood comes in and challenges it? I mean, those cases, you don't know they're going to the Supreme Court, but you know right off the bat they're a really big deal. Um, but the rest of the court's docket, 80 or 90 percent of it, um, are spent with cases that when they are filed in the lower courts, uh, nobody has the slightest idea that they could be headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, it's just a run-of-the-mill employment discrimination case or a run-of-the-mill drug prosecution or whatever it is. Uh, and what ends up happening is that that case ends up raising an issue of federal law that is occurring over and over again across the country and courts can't figure out what to do with it. So then what happens is, is the U.S. Supreme Court just plucks one of these cases essentially out of obscurity and uses it to decide this issue for the whole country. Uh, and so the opportunity that, um, that Pam um, uh, uh, identified and that I, um, I came into the clinic about a year later and you know, it was her pilot project that she began and that, and that I came in to kind of fully bring it to fruition uh, was that, um, you know, what about bringing clinical resources in the form of a couple faculty members who have 
some understanding experience with the court, along with student horsepower, um, to uh, shore up the advocacy in a lot of these cases, where it's the government, the federal government, and all of its resources against an individual criminal defendant and his local public defender, uh, or a big corporation in an employment case against a, 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 a plaintiff seek, you know, bringing in an uh, um, uh, employment charge or something. Uh, and so uh, that was the idea behind the clinic, was offering to shore up the resources uh, in cases where uh, people wouldn't necessarily have access uh, uh, to Supreme Court counsel. Um, and so that's, that's the primary way that we've um, uh, gone forward. Uh, you know, when we first started, uh, what that consisted of is us reading a lot of slip opinions and kind of putting the word out there that, you know, we're here, <laughs> we're happy to help. Uh, and, and so uh, through that being proactive, you know, the, the clinic started again. I get no credit for this, but the clinic, at, when it started as a pilot project, uh, started in the spring of 2004, and the students did four cert petitions, and all four got granted. Uh, so it was one of those uh, start with a bang things. Uh, and so luckily, we, were, you know, we had that initial success, and then now it's come to the point where uh, what, you know, we still occasionally call up and offer our services to, in situations like I described, but more and more it's really nice that people call us and say, well, I've got this case, and you know, would you be interested in coming in and helping? Do you, there's a lot been, that's been written lately about the fact that there are sort of 50 elite lawyers who seem to have the bulk of the Supreme Court cases. Do you feel like the clinic is in any way, I mean, obviously you're in some respects you're in that company, but at the same time you're serving the public interest in a different way. Do you feel like, especially in the civil cases, that you're a counterweight at all to the influence and power of a handful of firms that have done a lot of these cases? Uh, well, you know, I think that's one way to think about what we do, and I, 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 I don't want to puff ourselves up too much, but I do think um, that is one thing we do. Uh, so you, know, <laughs> you talked about our, our, our success, which we've had in doing cert petitions, and that's the way I just described us getting into cases, too. Another thing that our clinic does every year is four or five times a year, we do briefs in opposition to cert. Uh, so, uh, so a company or the government has lost a case and brings all of its heft to the table to ask the Supreme Court and expertise through some of the best lawyers in the country to ask the Supreme Court to take a case, will come in and help do the opposition. Again, trying to keep the case out of the Supreme Court and preserve the victory for somebody. So that's an example of kind of a counterweight of expertise. What kind of cases? Same kinds of cases. Same kinds of cases. Uh, just ones where our client has won below instead of lost below. Uh, so, um, you know, in terms of the Supreme Court bar, though, I do think, you know, there's a few interesting things that spin out from the dynamic you described of 50-some-odd of lawyers uh, uh, who have a, uh, you know, I guess these days a majority of the cases on the court's docket. Um, you know, one is it does, I think the, the first one we've talked about, which is it, you know, if somebody else ups their game, it makes you want to up your game. So it raises the level of advocacy and raises the level of expertise. Um, I don't think, however, that you can just jump to the conclusion that this regime we have is an unmitigated good. I mean, I do think there's some risks in the fact that you have this concentration of cases in the hands of a smaller group of lawyers. You know, one is most of the members of the Supreme Court bar, uh, as, as we, so if we use that term, are generalists. Um, you know, some of us uh, have certain areas of expertise, as you described, just some areas of criminal procedure, for example, that I'm particularly, uh, you know, pretty well versed in. Uh, but I also handle all kinds of other cases I don't know much about. And so I think there's a risk for the court that um, that it might not be getting... Um, uh, all the expertise substantively that it ought to get. If it takes a patent case, if it takes a bankruptcy case, if it takes a maritime <laughs> case, uh, you know, it. Ne I think the court, you know, needs to needs to know how this issue operates in the real world of those practice areas. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is when we come into cases, um, you know, we don't want to replace local counsel on the case. Uh, whether it's a public defender or a plaintiff's lawyer or whoever, we want to team up with that person. And what our goal is is that you know we put our Supreme Court generalist expertise together with that person's substantive expertise and substantive knowledge of the case. 
uh, to make the best possible presentation. So it's not, I think you have to be careful not to replace one with the other, because I think both of those things are critical for the court to have. How do you balance things like um, the fact that you have clients, sometimes they're criminal defendants, uh -huh. with um, teaching students and the development of the law and the sense that there's a kind of public interest behind this as well? Um, well, there's a few things I think that, that, that we do. Uh, you know, um, the fact that we have students and that we're running this as a clinic does make us quite different than any other Supreme Court litigation office. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure many of you in the audience are, are in a clinic, or hopefully you will be in one before you leave, because uh, it's a wonderful experience, whether it's you know, no matter what it is. Um, but because we're teaching in the clinic, uh, the big difference between my clinic and, and a Supreme Court practice at a Washington, D.C. law firm, for example, is you know, we're not in it for volume. Uh, we're not trying to get as many cases as we can. Uh, we're only picking a handful of cases uh, uh, that we can go at quite slowly and deliberately with the students. Uh, and so, um, you know, our process is not the student writes a draft and then we just rewrite it. Uh, you know, we build in five, six weeks of time where a team of students go through every step in the process of, you know, first digging into the record and background materials, then doing several drafts of an outline, then doing several drafts of the brief, all under the supervision uh, of the instructors. And so the way we write a brief um, ends up taking maybe three, four times as long as an ordinary law practice would take to write a brief. It's not a bill you could ever send to a client, uh, the amount of time we spend on it. And, and you know, I'm sure you appreciate if you are, in, again, in a clinic here at Duke, uh, some version of that probably happens in, in the clinic that you're in. Uh, so, so what that means is we're only working on a few small, a few, you know, a handful, probably um, less than a dozen cases a year. Uh, and I mean dozen cases at the different stages of the court's work. Um, and so then, you know, you act, you act about the public interest side of it, too, which is, uh, there's a lot to that question. Um, uh, and I guess I could answer it in a few different ways. I mean, one is, um, you know, sticking with the educational side of it, uh, you know, I view my clinic um, as different than other clinics in one respect. And, you know, most of the clinics, I don't know the full set of offerings you have here at Duke, but you know, most clinics at most law schools are organized around a subject area. So they're the immigration clinic or the, you know, the education clinic or whatever it is. Uh, you know, we don't have a subject matter other than the court itself. Uh, so you know, we're trying to teach the students about the court as an institution. Uh, and so because of that, I try to mix up our docket with different kinds of the court's work. Um, uh, so we try to mix it up with some civil, some criminal, some statutory, some, some constitutional, uh, some at the cert stage, some at the merit stage. So I try to give the students a cross-section uh, of the work. And then on, you know, on the more strictly public interest side, um, you know, one piece of it is what we've already talked about, which is I think it is very much in the public interest to level the playing field of advocacy in the court. And I've written about this mm -hmm. um, uh, in one article. Uh, but you know, I think there are certain areas where the, the advocacy in the court has traditionally been unbalanced, particularly where it's the US government always on one side and other lawyers uh, always on the other, where, you know, like it or not, you know, this is why we're on law school. Advocacy matters. And if you have an imbalance in the quality and expertise and advocacy on one side, you're naturally going to get an imbalanced set of results. I mean, the justices, like any other judges, are, you know, are going to do their best to reach the right outcome and to bring their own expertise and work to bear. But there are people, like everybody else, with limited knowledge of their own and limited time on their hands. And so that's the job of lawyers, is to sort of set them up to do the best possible job. And if lawyers are falling short in that respect, I don't think you can blame the justices, but I don't, also don't think you can be surprised that the outcomes are going to be skewed. Um, and then the last piece of the public interest thing I think is the most complicated, which is, um, you know, I'm happy to talk about this at greater length, but, but this is, um, you know, our relationship with other public interest groups that might care a lot about the issues that we're pushing. Uh, so on the criminal defense side, there are a few organizations like the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, you know, they have an institutional interest in uh, litigation in the court. And then on the civil side, and even more so, uh, 
there are various groups that care a lot about the issues uh, that we might be involved in. Uh, so I think that we have to be uh, uh, we have to be very aware of that and to cultivate good relationships with those groups. Doesn't mean we always have to be in lockstep with them, because uh, I don't view our clinic as an advocacy organization in exactly the same way uh, as, as, as those groups, uh, I think, view themselves. But it means that you know when you care about a common issue or get into a case with a client base that you know somebody cares a lot about and is going to be affected, you know, I think it behooves us to be in very close communication and understand from them what their perspectives and concerns are uh, and, uh, and just try and learn from that and be attentive to it. So you're not an, you know, an advocacy clinic and you have clients and you take cases when there are issues, though, that are interesting and important. Do you, in working up those cases and in helping the students to frame the arguments and in yourself um, eventually filing the briefs, are you pitching to particular justices and teaching the students to do that? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, I mean, one of the funny things about arguing in the U.S. Supreme Court that's different than a lot of other courts is uh, when you're writing your briefs, you know who your judges are. <laughs> you know, if you have a case in the Fourth Circuit, you don't know who your panel's going to be, and it could be very different people you end up having to argue that case in front of. You know, that's not the case in the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, absent a very rare and occasional retirement and new justice, you know who the people are who are going to decide your case. And in my view, you're completely foolish if you don't um, take that into consideration in terms of crafting your arguments. So, you know, I think I should probably break this down to the two steps. You know, there is the search stage and the merit stage. Uh, uh, at the cert stage, you know, uh, I'm sure most of you know, you need f only four votes to, to get the case taken up. Uh, and by and large, that stage isn't necessarily uh, concerned, or isn't concerned nearly as much with who should win the case. It's just whether the court ought to resolve an issue and decide an issue. Uh, so there, I think you spend a little less time targeting particular justices. Um, uh, if anything, I think what I am often doing at the search stage is, is reminding my students, you know, look, um, you know, we want to be talking to everybody here, not just, I mean, even somebody who might disagree with us on the merits. I mean, that's one way I think about doing a cert petition, is explain to a justice who might see this petition and say, I don't think I necessarily want your client to win. But having that justice still say, you know what? For the good of the country or the legal system, we ought to decide this case. Because all I care about at the search stage is getting in the door. Because you can't get anything accomplished if you don't get in the door. So persuading justices just to take the case is the first step. And so there, I think you just have to be thinking about um, every single justice. On the merits, I think things get a little more fine-grained because, uh, you know, as, as Justice Brennan famously said, the most important rule in the Supreme Court is how to count to five. Uh, and that's what the lawyer, that's what the job of any, um, any lawyer in the court is, is to get five votes for your position. And there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, uh, and the justices, as we know, have very, very different approaches to issues. So, you know, we can talk more in depth about this, but, you know, but the, but the Crawford case is one example, you know, where, where we said, okay, we're representing a criminal defendant and, uh, you know, with a process that, trial process that seemed rather unfair. How are we going to persuade five or more justices to, to vote for us? Uh, and among other things, we said, well, you know, there's a sort of robust historical argument behind the right to confrontation, and that might fit into Justice Thomas's and Justice Scalia's, you know, originalist perspective. And so all those kind of things get brought to bear in, in piecing together an argument. And I've, you know, we've joked in the clinic sometimes um, I've never, <laughs> never, never quite done this, but I've sometimes even joked in the clinic that you can sometimes look at a Supreme Court brief, and there might be three headers, you know, three different main arguments, and 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 you know they'll be descriptive. You know, the the history and tradition of the Fourteenth Amendment dictates such and such. You know, um, fundamental fairness also dictates, and it's almost like they should be. Justice Thomas and Scalia turn to page 22. <laughs> Justice Breyer, you're going to really like page 35. You know, and I mean, so that's, they're almost you. coded to that degree in the court sometimes. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, the, you know, I, the justices have different perspectives that are all legitimate. And as a lawyer, your job is to, is, is to, is to argue. I mean, I think that's one of the things you have to do is force yourself to think about your case from those different dimensions.
So you had almost all of them on the confrontation clause, and then you lost half of them. So what, <laughs> what, over time, um, it, so it's, it's not stable either, some of, some of these coalitions or some of these pitches that, that you might want to make. It was a really interesting, so the culture of the court changes and moves underneath you a little bit too, the way they interact with each other and the, yeah. the um, things that, that their, their primary commitments. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel like um, you need to adjust your, change your fundamental view, or you just doggedly adhere to where you started? Uh, no, there's a lot to that question. It's a great question, and because uh, you know, I'm always in the mode of oral ad advocacy, I'll answer it first and then evaluate. Yes, I think you have to change uh, and adjust as things go on. Um, but uh, but to use the, the confrontation clause uh, as an example, uh, you know, we started out with seven justices on board, sure. right? Um, we got a unanimous decision, but. Uh, but Justice uh, in Crawford itself, but Justice O'Connor and the Chief Justice, who was, who was uh, Rehnquist at the time, uh, weren't, weren't on board with the shift of um, approach. But in that majority, we also we had um, Justices Kennedy and Breyer, uh, among others. Uh, and uh, over time, um, uh, you know, again, we can go into much greater depth, but obviously some of those justices have become less enchanted uh, with what Crawford brought to the table. You know, there's a, th I, there's a lot I could say. I'll say a couple things about Crawford. I mean, one is, um, I, I've, I've really joked, and, you know, you mentioned at the top, I've done a lot of cases by now, which um, I never would have expected, um, but it's just been lucky that my career has unfolded that way. Uh, but I don't think I've ever done a case more difficult than Crawford and I probably won't. And it was my first case. <laughs> you know, it's just like you go up to the court and say, "I would really like you to change the entire way you approach this constitutional clause." Um, do you have any questions? Uh, and you know, that's what the Crawford argument was. Um, I mean, maybe kind of the hubris of youth. Uh, but um, it was a very bold case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, so a couple things about it. I mean, so one is. I did my best, as I described earlier, to talk to evidence professors in academia, to talk to practitioners, and everything else I could get my hands on uh, to give me advice as to uh, not just what my argument ought to be in a doctrinal sense, but what the consequences of that argument would be. Um, and I will forthrightly say that even I underestimated um, the, um, the full consequence of the argument that I was making. Uh, I don't think I would change anything now, uh, knowing it, but I didn't realize quite how far, I would say, off the rails uh, most states across the country had gone in terms of taking the, the, the free reign that the court had given them for a generation to basically do whatever they wanted under their own rules of evidence, free and clear of the Confrontation Clause. Uh, and I think once I get starking about this talking, it's hard to stop. But I'll just say there's one, one little lesson, and I've always wanted to write this piece. I never have. But it's an interesting thought exercise for those of you that have taken criminal procedure. You know, when you take criminal procedure, you kind of do the incorporation revolution, right? You do map against Ohio. You do Miranda. You do all the cases in the 60s and 70s where the Supreme Court um, you know, inc first incorporated the Bill of Rights against the states. And all those were momentous decisions that required a lot of work um, uh, to kind of straighten out and bring the states into line and all the rest. Um, you know, an interesting thing is, imagine if Crawford had been decided in 1968. Um, you know, I think things would have been a lot easier and gone about differently. But instead, what happened is the court decided, first a case called Dutton against Evans, and then uh, Roberts, uh, in 1980, where the court, as I said, basically said to the states, actually, you pretty much don't have to worry about the Confrontation Clause. And so what happened there is you not just had the situation that a bunch of states were in with respect to the other constitutional criminal procedure amendments, where you know they'd been doing things for a while, uh, and now they have to bring themselves into line. You had like an affirmative free pass given to them for a generation from the court to do whatever they wanted. And... Um, and I think, naturally, states pushed that really hard, and people got invested. You know, we all think about stare decisis and all the rest, but people got invested and had settled expectations that we can just do all this stuff, whatever we want under evidence rules. 
Then when you come back around and say, now, oh no, never mind, now you have to follow like this meaning of the confrontation clause, it's all the harder to implement that against the states. And I think just the resistance you're going to meet in that situation is going to be much stronger, much more deeply entrenched. And so I think that's part of the challenge that Crawford has. Um, and in terms of the court um, uh, slipping, I think when the I think the moment where that what I just described really set in was when we did the forensic evidence mm -hmm. cases, uh, Melendez Diaz in 2009 being the first, and, and um, uh, where we said that the confrontation clause should apply to forensic evidence for those of you who haven't who haven't taken the case, uh, taken that class, so that uh, forensic analysts in the lab who did a fingerprint analysis or a drug analysis or whatever it is, um, would have to come in and testify, not just send a report uh, into the court. Um, and, you know, that was the moment where I was like, oh, my God, you know, 47 states uh, and the federal government basically have pretended the Confrontation Clause doesn't apply in this setting. I use the word pretended. That's loaded. But <laughs> acted as though it doesn't uh, apply in this concluded setting. Concluded that it doesn't Yes, concluded, determined. Um, and, and that's where uh, Justice uh, Breyer and Kennedy, who are both you know, intensely practical in their approach to the law, um, uh, I think just they just got very, very concerned. Uh, and I remember thinking, I mean, this, is, this goes back to your question about building, uh, building your arguments for different justices. You know, uh, this was a case we did in the clinic. And just to show you how little I know sometimes, I said to my students, I said, we're going to win this nine to nothing. I said, because, you know, what's great is certain justices approach constitutional criminal procedure and the confrontation clause in a kind of legally formalistic way. You know, rules are rules, and, you know, that's that. And, you know, for those justices, we've got a great argument because these forensic analysts are just sending in affidavits. And the one thing the history tells you is that the Confrontation Clause and Crawford are meant to prohibit trial by affidavit. So as a legal formal, formalist legal matter, we have an absolutely clear-cut case. And then there's these other justices, you know, who I have loosely call the pragmatists. Um, and those justices are not going to be so worried about formal rules, but they're really worried about consequences. And you know what's great is for those justices, we'll just tell them about all these horrible lab scandals out there and how unreliable lab reports are. Uh, and can be. And North Carolina has been the site of, you know, one of those uh, 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 events. Uh, and that's why I said we're going to get both camps. And as it turned out, the state, the state and the and, and the prosecution side on the other side won the battle of the pragmatists. And I think persuaded a majority of the court that even the uh, not a majority they persuaded those four justices mm -hmm. that even though. Um, uh, even though there have been some bad things that have happened, by and large, confrontation in this setting would not be worth the, the burden. Uh, and so I feel, you know, I actually feel like I came up short in losing those four justices. I mean, we still won the case, but, but that has been, that was, uh, you know, uh, a setback. Uh, and that is, I think, what is entrenched. So I still think of the confrontation clause. This is the longest answer ever, but uh, but I still think of the confrontation. Issue. It is. Uh, I mean, so um, as we were saying earlier, one of my colleagues at Stanford, George Fisher, uh, uh, teaches uh, uh, writes a leading evidence case book and is a is a great scholar in this area and actually is a um, uh, let's say a Crawford doubter. Uh, and so he and I talk a lot. And, you know, George's view, just to put it fairly on the table, is that um, the Crawford coalition is crumbling, uh, you've, you're down to five, and, you know, you may, you may lose everything in the next few years. Um, <laughs> he's a good friend. <laughs> uh, um, and my view is, my view is, um, is that the justices are really kind of a little bit more nuanced. I think there is... Deep, deep skepticism among four of them of Crawford as applied to forensic evidence. I still think Crawford as applied to what Justice Kennedy's called conventional witnesses, which is eyewitnesses, victims, people on the scene who report to the police what happened. I still think Crawford is the right approach there. Now, they're going to, I mean, I still think the court believes Crawford is the right approach there. Now, they're going to end up debating how broadly it ought to apply you know, when, when exactly are those, witness, are those people speaking as witnesses under the Confrontation Clause? But I still think that's the approach they're going to stick with. It's just that some are going to 
ask for it to be broader. Some are asked to be narrower. But in the but in the but in the forensic realm, you know, Justice Alito has pretty much announced like, if I can get five votes for this, I want to try and overrule those cases. So, uh, so I'm hoping he doesn't get his five votes. Well, speaking of counting to five. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about your experience as an oral advocate before the court. Um, Justice Thomas has famously gone 10 years without speaking at oral argument. And I guess the question is, is he onto something or is he missing an <laughs> opportunity by not participating more in the argument? Do you feel like they're talking past you when you're, and I mean, obviously you prepare extensively, you moot the cases. It's, a, it's an incredibly intense experience to do it. But do you feel like the die is cast when you stand up or are, is a lot changing while you're there? Um, so it, there's different ways I could answer that. You say, is the die cast? I, I, I always tell myself that oral argument matters, or at least can matter, except for the night before oral argument, where I tell myself, this isn't going to matter. So I can just go and sleep, sleep well. Um, but, uh, but as, but as uh, you know, having had the one year lucky enough to be in the building clerking, um, and now as a, as a lawyer, I, I do think oral argument is, is quite quite important. I, I would never say it's more important than the briefs, uh, but I do really think um, uh, I really do take it very seriously and think that you can move the needle. Uh, you know, just to use your Justice Thomas uh, a statistic as a jumping off point. You know, what Justice Thomas has said is that he thinks the court itself now is too active. It gets too much in the way of lawyers being able to to make their arguments. Um, he might be a little bit onto something in that respect. I mean, I think um, I think somebody did a statistical analysis of the typical thirty-minute argument uh, for for you know each side typically gets thirty minutes, and I think there are typically at least thirty questions in those thirty minutes. So if you think about the time it takes a justice to actually verbalize a question, uh, that means that you're getting on average you know twenty thirty seconds to answer each question, uh, which. Two or three sentences usually is the most you'll ever see in a transcript uh, uh, strung together when the justices are engaged. So I think you could make an argument that that's a little aggressive, but but by and large I'm much more um, much more on the other eight side that I want to have that dialogue. I mean, my view when I go up there is I've had 50 pages of a brief to tell you what I think and to frame the case the way I want it framed. Uh, and this half an hour for me is, is, is I want to hear what you think. I want to hear what your concerns are. And this is where I do think it's a pity that Justice Thomas doesn't speak up sometimes. And the confrontation clauses are a perfect example, those cases, because he's actually a swing vote in some of those well, cases. Well, we know what his position is, though. He doesn't need to announce it any further. Fair enough. But, um, you know, take Williams against Illinois. I mean, we didn't know how, you know, he was the swing vote. You didn't know how he was going to come out. Um, Turned on the seal. Right. So I'd love to, I would have, you know, I didn't argue that case, but I'd love to have that, I'd love to have a dialogue with him. I mean, I would put another way, you know, any justice whose vote is on the table or who is concerned about something, I want to have at least a chance to answer it. I mean, I may not, I may not persuade the person. Uh, but, uh, so actually, as an advocate at argument, one thing that I try and do is, you know, if you've listened to Supreme Court arguments, you'll hear they're kind of conversational. Uh, they're not casual. Um, but they're not formal either. Uh, it's kind of a, um, a professional conversation is the way I would describe it. And um, I think even another, another Duke graduate, uh, Michael Dreben, who's a fabulous lawyer in front of the court, who I've argued opposite uh, several times, who's the deputy in the Solicitor General's office that handles um, uh, criminal cases. Um, and I think Michael put it this way, which I think is right, is that you get up there and you want to draw them out I mean, if, 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 if I get up there and I say five or six sentences and they haven't talked yet, I actually will pause mm -hmm. and just, I, am, I want them to start talking because talking at them, again, is not really very likely to change anybody's mind. Um, but having somebody ask you the thing that's bothering them and you having a chance to answer it, uh, I think you're much more likely to make some headway there. So speaking of um, making headway, one of your cases that a lot of our students are really interested in you, you actually did achieve a degree of unanimity, um, which is the Riley case. You surprised observers everywhere. Um, so the, the Riley case concerns uh, searches incident to arrest and whether or not law enforcement can look through your smartphone um, upon arresting you. 
And Professor Fisher argued that case, and it got a lot of attention for a variety of reasons. And um, I want to hear a little bit about your experience of arguing the case. Yeah. One of the things that's so interesting about it is that the justices are famous <laughs> technophobes. Um, <laughs> they sometimes ask questions indicating they don't really understand the way phones right. work or texting works. They, uh, the, the Chief Justice famously writes things out in longhand when he, <laughs> when he drafts things. Um, so they're not technologically savvy, but somehow, mm -hmm. in this case, you got them over <laughs> that hurdle. And how does that happen? What, what occurred there? Uh, no, I appreciate you asking. It's always fun to talk about your victories. It's a big victory. No. Uh, so that was a blast. Um, so a few things I'd say about that case. One is just to, just to give a, you know, for the students who might not know, one example, another example that you could have strung on for the justices is a few years before there was a case, very minor case called uh, City of Ontario versus Quan involved a police officer using his uh, uh, county issue smartphone and texting back and forth, uh, and whether there was a First Amendment claim. But at any rate, during the argument, Justice Kennedy interrupted one of the lawyers and said, I'm just curious, if you're texting somebody and somebody else is trying to text you, is there like a call waiting that happens? Or, <laughs> you know, and you're just. And I think Justice Scalia uh, actually asked yeah. if it was possible to get hard copies or if they only existed digital. <laughs> yes, same argument. I know. I know. So, so that's, what, that's what we had in our mind when we were preparing for the Riley case. So yeah, that's like the scene, right? Um, so, there, so, so let me answer your question in two ways. Um, uh, one is um, uh, talk about, the, uh, in particular, the technological challenge, and then uh, I can also answer it in the form that you asked earlier, which is how did you pitch it to different justices? Um, but on the technological side, so we totally understood that we had a lot of work to do. And thankfully for me, I had, you know, wonderful Stanford students. And I kind of viewed myself as kind of somewhere in between where the students live their lives and where the justices were. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be the translator here. Like, I think I can under, if the students really explain to me the way smartphones are used in their everyday lives, I can then get that and try and translate it for the justices. At the same time, I said to the students, more than any brief I've ever written, we actually wrote this brief on two levels. One level was to the justices and the other level was to the clerks. And there were ways where we were almost writing, especially with footnotes, kind of, we would say something in plain English and then drop a footnote for the, like the law clerk and say, here's, you know, here's how you explain it to your boss. <laughs> uh, and, and, and maybe even the best example of this is we got into a debate with the government about whether they should be able to search smartphones they seized um, out of fear that um, if they didn't search them right away, they could be remotely wiped um, while they were in the process of getting a warrant. And so one of our answers was, well, police officers have plenty of things they could do at the scene to protect against that. One is just, for example, put the phone in airplane mode uh, or, or, you know, uh, turn it off or such. Um, and so, or, um, you know, a couple other things. And we were working on this, and finally we got the idea with our students, like, let's just actually put an appendix and do screenshots of the three buttons you have to push to put a phone, you know, to turn the signal off the phone. Uh, just so, you know, so I can refer to that at argument if necessary and the justices can see just how easy it is. And so the law clerks, again, we were imagining the law clerk sitting down and saying, look, you press this, you know, then you... Um, and so we did that. And one of our students had her, had her iPhone as the appendix to our reply brief. Fame to fame. And she was so hoping that, 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 that it would be an exhibit in the court's opinion. So we got the next best thing, which is in the majority opinion, uh, the Chief Justice actually cites to the appendix, cites to her smartphone. But, and you can imagine all the effort that was done about which apps should be on that screen. Um, so um, at any all rate. The ones linking to the Constitution. <laughs> exactly, right. Right, the Bill of Rights Club, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, and so, um, so, so that was one thing we did, is that we really did argue the case on these two levels uh, to try to uh, give the court, um, the, the, the clerks ammunition to explain to their bosses um, uh, what this all meant. And, uh, and we tried to generate, we used amicus briefs uh, to help tell the story. So, so we could say something in a sentence or a paragraph and then cite to, um, to a few amicus briefs that sort of spelled spelled out in all kinds of various ways uh, the, rea the modern reality of the smartphone. Um, but then to bring those technological arguments 
down to earth in the Constitution, you still had to take a further step. And that's where we go back to this idea of how do you pitch your case to different justices. And as we thought about it, we ended up having kind of three different camps of justices. So again, starting with the starting with the originalists and the, uh, the historians on the court, uh, we said, okay, what's the purpose of the Fourth Amendment? And what is really history behind the Fourth Amendment is to prohibit general warrants. It's because the framers during the colonial times uh, were really concerned about uh, police officers, there weren't police officers, but governmental agents uh, uh, investigating somebody and just searching their entire home or their entire office. And there were these famous cases of searching somebody's bu you know, entire bureau and desks and all their letters. Well, we told those justices, um, you know, if that was the concern of the Fourth Amendment at the time it was framed, the only way to make that protection relevant in modern times is to say the same protection applies to a computer device that we have in our pocket with all that same information. So if all of our papers that used to be kept in bureaus, desks, and in our cabinets in the home are now available in our smartphone, you have to protect the smartphone the same way you used to protect those things. Um, for some of the more pragmatic justices, uh, you know, we made a series of arguments about um, you know, the modern reality of smartphone and the amount of information and the quantity of information. Um, you know, one amicus brief, for example, explained how an, I, how an iPhone 6, if, you know, if you printed up all the Word documents it could hold, it would fill an entire football field with paper 10 feet high. Uh, and so you sort of say any, any analogy anybody's trying to draw to carrying a briefcase full of documents is just ridiculous. Um, there's all kinds of things uh, that... Um, that you know, in pragmatic sense, a smartphone completely outstrips uh, any other tangible physical object uh, that existed in the pre-digital world. And then for the sort of last group of justices, who we thought of as like the most technologically savvy group of the justices, um, we made the argument that we kind of encapsulated as digital is different. Uh, we just said, you don't even try and draw an analogy. It is a fool's errand to sort of draw an analogy from a smartphone or an iPad or a laptop to some kind of tangible representation of what it would hold. Because not only do these things hold paper and email and uh, you know, documents and email and all the rest, but they also nowadays, you know, they have cameras that monitor the inside of our house. They do our heart rate. Uh, they do all these things uh, that no physical device ever did. Um, and so, um, you know, one of, one of the things we came up with a few days before argument, and so, you know, as you probably know, the students don't get to do the argument in this clinic, but they do come to Washington, and we do the moots together, and we prepare together right up until, and they come to court and all the rest. And so we were sitting around a few days before, and I remember we are kind of trying to get that point encapsulated um, uh, for argument, because you need little, as I said, you know, little smart tidbits that you can use. And we, um, we came up with the, with, with the, with the line uh, uh, that um, comparing, you know, uh, uh, comparing a smartphone to like a briefcase is like comparing um, uh, a, like a, ride on, a bicycle ride to a 747. Uh, like they're both modes of transportation, but like that's about all they have in common. Um, and as it turned out, an argument, I never got that line out. Uh, it just didn't, you know, there's lots of all kinds of great material you have to leave on the cutting room floor. And I never got a moment to say that line. But lo and behold, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion comes out, um, which was unanimous, as you said. And a, even that was a big surprise for us. It was a wonderful surprise. And he actually had an even better version. He said, he said it's like comparing a ride on horseback to a trip to the moon. Uh, and, and like that was like for the students and I, it was like, you know, we had this mind meld. Yeah, mind meld yeah exactly. Passes. I mean, you Doesn't can't, there's that. nothing that gets better than that. Like we didn't even have to make the argument, but it just kind of came across. Yeah. Um, there's, you've had so many interesting cases I would love to ask you about, but I want to make sure that the students get to ask questions. So is, does anyone have questions for Professor Fisher? Katie. in the court below, and ideas about changing the law and really feeling like the law is wrong, like in the Confrontation Clause, you know, in yeah. this area. How do you balance those considerations? Yeah, I, I guess I'd have to, to be really fair, to, it's a great question, and to be fair to your question, I would, almost, I would really have to say that I don't have a consistent answer to that question. 
uh, because there are certain areas of law, like the Confrontation Clause, where I think I am more, I have to be honest and say I am more of a cause lawyer, like I do have a vision of what the law I think it should be. In those areas, I'm going to be probably more selective about the cases that I choose because I am on more of a law reform mission. Um, those are the exception, though. Um, uh, more, most of the cases I handle, I don't have a preordained. I certainly wouldn't claim to be that much of an expert and have a preordained view of the world. Now, I might have a gut instinct as to which side uh, I'm inclined to favor, but, um, but those are a little more just one-off cases. Uh, now, how do I balance those two things? Um, I guess what I would say is there are two very distinct steps. Uh, the first step, um, and this is where you know the clinic is different than most law offices. I mean, if you're a, if you're a law firm who represents you know a corporation and they call you and say, "I've got this legal problem," I mean, you're on the case, right? But we choose our cases, and so. And so that step of deciding whether to get into a case, I do think it's fair game, and we often have conversations in the clinic like, is this going to serve the public interest? Do we think we can you know, get this client some measure of success? Uh, and there's all kinds of, you can imagine, all kinds of different arguments and dimensions we might have brought to the table in that conversation. Um, but once we sign up for a case, so all that conversation can happen <coughs> up front, and we can decide for whatever reason, that we don't think this is the case for us. Once we sign up for a case, I, I think we're, you know, we are 100% beholden to the client at that point to get whatever the best result we can for that client might be. Um, and so, you know, if there's some argument you don't want to make for some reason, um, you better not take the case. Um, uh, once you're in the case, I don't view ourselves as being any different than any other lawyer who has, you know, all the traditional duties of loyalty uh, to the client. Yeah, um, this is a bit more career oriented, I guess. Yeah. But um, seeing as you've worked one of my dream jobs, basically, like, how do you even get into that area of practice? I suppose of getting into that, um, you know, appellate litigation that's going to, you know, gear towards the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to be honest and say it's a fair amount of good fortune. Uh, so I definitely have to own up to that. Um, so I guess there's a few things that I did along the way, some of which were probably I can claim some degree of design and some of which, frankly, were good for, just straight-up good fortune. Um, you know, the first thing that I did was, was uh, uh, do a couple of appellate clerkships. Um, and so, uh, you know, clerking of any kind, I think, is invaluable. But if you're interested in, um, uh, if you're interested in appellate work, uh, doing an appellate clerkship, I think, is a great experience. One thing that I would tell all of you, and I tell all the Stanford students the same thing, um, at least more and more of, of our students are doing two clerkships. Uh, and so I think that's definitely a thing to consider. Uh, and among, especially if you're doing two clerkships, I would very, take very seriously the state court system as well. I mean, I think you can learn a massive amount, like in a state Supreme Court clerkship, for example. So I don't think it has to be a federal appellate clerkship. You know, sometimes those are a little bit hard to get. Um, so, um, uh, but clerking was the first step, you know, kind of get a sense from the inside. Um, you know, then uh, my path was I went to a law firm that had a kind of quite a variety of practice. And so, uh, and so within that, I just partially, it's just a little bit of uh, self-starterness. I just offered up myself uh, within the firm as, as uh, to other lawyers uh, as somebody who would enjoy doing appellate work or stuff that was like it. I mean, for example, when I was at the law firm, I would do just I did some other things before administrative agencies and district courts, but that were more deep writing and research exercises. Um, the other thing I did, and this was really the breakthrough for me, so I'll just tell all of you as, a, um, as, as just a sort of one story. Um, the real breakthrough for me, and this is how I got the Crawford case and the Blakely case, which uh, were my first two cases, uh, were by uh, offering up for pro bono work. Uh, so I, uh, when I got to Seattle, uh, shortly after getting there, I reached out to the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and said, um, you know, I've seen that you file amicus briefs sometimes in Supreme Court cases, uh, and would you like somebody once in a while to, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in doing that now and then as an, as an amicus, as a amicus pro bono project. And the great thing about those offering up your services pro bono wise um, uh, is that for appellate cases, is it's a pretty well defined project. 
uh, I mean, it's not like you're taking on some case that you don't know it could spin out of control. A trial. Or a something. trial, exactly. Uh, you know, offering up to do an, an appellate brief, if you, look at, if you look at your schedule and say, you know what, over the next three or four months, I've got a chunk of time that I could devote to this, um, you know, you can manage it. Um, and you don't have to be too scared about taking it on. And so what ended up happening for me is that through, um, through doing criminal briefs for NACDL a few times, uh, uh, and uh, I got a couple. I got the Crawford and Blakely case. Did a couple other amicus briefs uh, through that project. Uh, meanwhile, I also had offered my services to the um, ACLU of Washington. Uh, and it was actually a funny story. When I was moving to Seattle, I called this, the, a lawyer who I knew that worked in the ACLU and said, "Do you have any advice for me about public interest jobs in town?" <coughs> and his answer was. Uh, well, we only have one lawyer in our office, and you can't have my job. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, but we got to be friends, and within a within a year of going to the firm, he sent me a case in the Washington State Supreme Court uh, to do on behalf of the ACLU. And so, the thing that turned out to be the breakthrough for me, and I again partly is because I was just interested in the work. I don't think I had a great grand design, but that I ended up all of a sudden I'm doing a case in the Washington Supreme Court. I got a cert petition granted. I'm filing an amicus brief in the Ninth Circuit. And all of a sudden, when the next couple paying clients come around, who's the guy in the office who's actually handled appellate cases? And, like all, and, and, and even paying clients say, oh, you've argued a case in Washington Supreme Court. I feel comfortable with you. And so that's one way to kind of get yourself uh, a jumping off point, I think. And so for me, that was, that was huge. Thank you. Great question. What's your favorite case? <laughs> like my, it's like asking your favorite child, uh, you know. So the the favorite case, uh, I, I, cost I, I would say a few. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you know, I would say that I'll give you three cases. Um, that's the best I can do. Uh, and we've talked about two of them already. Uh, I mean, Crawford was just it, an yes. incredible intellectual <laughs> exercise. Uh, and Riley was also just, uh, I, I mean, when I was working on Riley, I remember saying to a couple friends, I was like, I have not had this much fun since, Amazing since, since Crawford. There was just so much to think about. It was so, so fun. Um, you know, but, but then it's not just the big headliner cases. I mean, another case that is uh, incredibly dear to my heart is when I moved it here at Duke. Um, I believe three or four years ago, called Lozman versus City of Riviera Beach. Mm -hmm. And the issue in that case was whether a floating home is a vessel under maritime law. Put another way, the, art, the, the issue in the case is what's the definition of a boat? <laughs> and it was just like these, it was like the kind of thing you do in the very first class of your, very, of your lawful, law school experience. It's like, give me a definition, and now I'm going to tell you everything wrong with it. Uh, and so it was just a really fun case with lower stakes, but it was just the essence of the law in a way that made us think. And so we had to do in the clinic, we had to say, okay, there's a def actually there is a definition of the word vessel in the U.S. Code, and so we had to approach that as a textual matter. We had to ask ourselves kind of as a purpose and descriptive matter, like what makes sense, what's going to work in maritime law, and all these other things. Uh, and you know, and the and the justices themselves, I think, had a great time with that case. I mean. Justice Kagan, there was one point in the argument where Justice Kagan was asking the other side, you know, what about a, what about a kid floaty or an inner tube? And, you know, there were just, we all had a bunch of fun with that case. So it doesn't have to be really big to be really fun. Thank you for coming back to Duke. Happy to have you anytime. Pleasure to talk to you about your cases. And um, I know it was really interesting for the students, too. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much.